Shannon, what's your reaction? To say that I'm disappointed in T.O. not going to the hall for this very special and joyous occasion would be an understatement because I don't realize, I don't realize, I don't know if T.O. realizes. Yep. I realize, I don't know if T.O. realizes how many guys that are in the Hall of Fame that went to bat for him with the voters that select That's you true. To, to go into the Hall of Fame. Uh, especially you. Yes. Skip, I've gotten to know T.O. a little bit, a little bit better um, over the last couple of years, talked to him. And I've always said this, and I knew this about him the very first time I met him and talked to him. If T.O. feel you've ever wronged him, he'll never forgive you for it. He'll never, <laughs> ever let you, let you forget. See, Skip, when he says, well, and you've asked him the validation, he says, well, I don't need validation. Well, actually... Skip, we all want validation. You practice during the course of the week. We play football, Skip. I practice hard. I watch tape. Yep. My ultimate validation besides winning was getting the ball into the end zone. Yep. I need to be validated that my hard work was playing off. Skip, I get it. You're asking 50 <sighs> men and women that never played professional sport to give you your ultimate validation if you're a professional athlete. Yep. And that is to go into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And... He's so caught up, and rightfully, Skip, should he have been a first ballot? I believe he should have. But, Skip, when they ask, will the pro football, well, anybody that's a Hall of Famer, will they please stand? They don't ask if anybody's a first ballot, stand. If anybody's a second ballot. Because guess what, Skip? I'm in the same building as Joe Montana, and Jerry Rice, and Emmitt Smith, and Eric Dickerson. I'm in the same building. I went in the, on the third time. You did. Mike Dicker took him 12 times to get in. <sighs> Jerry Kramer, I think it took him over 30 years. <laughs> I know it did. Skip, this is an opportunity. And he says in the statement, I, I looked at it a little bit, and it says, like, after visiting the hall, I came to the realization I wanted to share this moment with. Skip, that's why they allow you to go on stage. That's why they allow you to speak to the people in attendance and the people watching at home. This is your opportunity to put a face to the name that helped you get to that point. While I stood on that stage, Skip, mm -hmm. this was my opportunity mm -hmm. to thank everybody that helped Shannon Sharp go from Glenville, Georgia, to Savannah State, to Denver, to Baltimore, to here. Mm -hmm. This was my one opportunity. It was. Mm. And people often ask, well, Shannon, man, your speech was good, and I thank them. It's like, well, how long did it take you? I said, this speech has been writing itself for 43 years. <laughs> T.O., that speech has been writing itself for a very, very long time. What about George Stewart? He was going to have, the presenter. his presenter uh, mm -hmm. was going to have an opportunity that very few people get, Skip. You can only have one, and it's archived. You think about this. <sighs> there have been 25,000 men, about roughly about 25,000 men, Mm. Skip, that said, I played in the NFL. Less than 400 mm. are in Canton. Some first ballot, some third ballot, some 13th, some 30 years in the making. Mm. But they're in that building and it's special. T.O., the Hall of Fame, the building itself, they didn't do anything to you. Okay, you're upset at the writers that vote, but that's the guidelines in which all professional sports, that's how they do it. And baseball and basketball and hockey skip, the writers select. Sure, I would like to see more guys that are in the Pro Hall of Fame have a voice, but that's not how it is. And until they change that, we have to go by the guidelines which are set forth. This is very, very disappointing. And it also gives them validation. See, I told you, this is why we kept his butt out for as long as we had. This is why. When we talk to his former teammates, this is what they said. When we talk to his former coaches, this is what they said. You're giving them validation. T.O., do you think you're the only one? Skip, I didn't get in on the first ballot. I thought I should because I had all the records. I had championships. But I wanted to get in on the first ballot for a very different reason. My grandmother was very sick. Yep. The one person I wanted to know that her baby had made it to the Hall of Fame Skip, she was, had a leg amputated. She was going to have a leg amputated. The doctors mm. told my sister, now you know at her age, 
going under anesthesia is not mm -hmm. a sure thing. She has a leg amputated in the process of being sedated, Skip. She has a heart attack. Mm. So that's 2009, my first year of eligibility. She comes out of it. So I'm thinking, surely in 2010, Skip, mm. I don't get in. So I know I'm on borrowed time now. 2011, I go in. I call my grandmother. My sister handled the phone. She said, hey. I said, uh, I made the Hall of Fame, Granny. She said, what's that? I say, that's where all the good football players go once they're done playing. She said, ooh, that show is good, baby. I sure hope I'm around to see it. Skip, she died one month before the ceremony, mm. but I got an opportunity to you tell, tell her. her. Yep. Skip, this is T.O. This is your opportunity to tell people about how great a job your grandmother did. Your mom, thank some of the coaches. Skip, this is so wrong with T.O. because he's been vindictive. This is about you're not taking any power back because those 50 million women still have the right to vote. They're going to vote again in 2019 for a new class. You didn't take anything away. You robbing you. You're robbing fans in San Francisco and Dallas because maybe some of the teammates and maybe some of the coaches didn't like you, but there are a lot of fans that loved you, T.O., and you're robbing them of the opportunity to hear you and thank people that helped you get there. Skip, this is so, so disappointing. This should be so, so beneath T.O., and I'm terribly, terribly disappointed that he mm. chose this, made this decision. So am I, for all the reasons you so eloquently and emotionally just detailed. But I wasn't surprised by it. I was just frustrated that Terrell's missing an opportunity to put all the negativity behind him, to rise above everything, all the conflict, all the controversy, he could have risen all the way above that and become the living legend that his numbers say he deserves to Absolutely. be. Absolutely. You mentioned it, but we had Terrell on the show this past Tuesday. I've obviously had many battles with him. I covered him back in his days in San Francisco, but I did immediately congratulate him on his selection, finally, into the Hall of Fame. And I told him right after our first segment that, that he seemed different. He seemed good different. He seemed a little more at peace. He seemed to be a little less defensive. And of course, as soon as I told him that, he got defensive with me. <laughs> well, wait a minute. No, I'm not. That's terrible, right. right? That's that guy. And yet I told him my two cents from a distance. You know what? Just, just go embrace this in early August. Just, just go up and give in to it and... and and appreciate what you pulled off coming from that small town in Alabama through UT Chattanooga, yes. having to fight his way onto the 49er roster. It's hard, man. It was a long, hard road, and he's had a lot of issues off the field that he had to deal with, and, and he dealt with them. And it, it finally reached fruition. However many times it took, it took Chris Carter six times to get in. Yeah. But the point is, once you get in, nobody remembers how many times. Before the show today, I was thinking, how many times did it take Shannon? I can't remember. Yeah. I knew it wasn't the first, right. but, but was it the second? No, it was the third. I couldn't remember Chris Carter. Was it, well, I don't know, six times. Mm -hmm. Nobody remembers. You're in the Hall of Forever. Fame. Forever. You can't get traded. You can't get cut. No. Nope. So... He had even gone to the, to the distance of, of selecting George Stewart. And you made a great point because George Stewart has to be crushed by this because this was going to be a big moment yes! for him because he played a key role in the evolution of young Terrell where he was the man, as Terrell sat right here and told us, that kept pulling him aside saying, you can do this. You can be special. Mm -hmm. And it, th that, that was a big thing for him yes. coming from UT Chattanooga and looking across the field at Jerry Rice and practicing. Can I do that? Mm -hmm. Yep, you can do that. Right. So here's my bottom line. Terrell sat back maybe after our show and said, I don't know if I want to give up my martyr card. I, I don't know if I want to take the chip off my shoulder because the Terrell I know has never been happy unless he's unhappy. Mm -hmm. It's just the way he's built. I, I don't know why. It's just, it's, it's who he's always been to the point that it was just hard for him to ever be a unifying member of a team because he's not, he, he's a solo act. Mm -hmm. And he's a solo act 
who's always been done wrong by somebody. Right. He's, he's always got an ax to grind. He's always being fueled by somebody, somebody not believing in him or doing him wrong. Right. You know that. Yes. And, and it's, he, he loves to have that chip on his shoulder. And you brought it up, and I don't want to say I told you so, but I do feel like this validates the guy that I kept telling you he is. And again, I never argued with the numbers because you kept saying, look at these numbers. Mm -hmm. Well, they're obvious. Mm -hmm. They're first ballot Hall of Fame numbers. But unfortunately for me, I saw too much. I covered the San Francisco team in which he was, and again, I nicknamed him Team Obliterator because I, he, I was close to people on three teams in a row. And they're all really good football teams. These were all Super Bowl contenders, 49ers, Eagles, Cowboys. And each time he, he went into the mode of, I've been slighted or misled or mistreated mm -hmm. by my head coach, my coordinator, and ultimately my quarterback. Not in Dallas, but Jeff Garcia, Donovan McNabb. He did fight constantly with his position coaches because position they were the coaches. closest to him. They were. And so I knew a bunch of players on the San Francisco team who kept pulling me aside saying, we're having a hard time with him. We can't win with him. He's truly, he was the most divisive football player or player of any sport that I ever covered. Mm -hmm. And then I was close to so many of the, the, the leaders of the Eagles who I worked with at ESPN, and they kept telling me, he's just, man, he's just hard, hard to play with, hard to deal with. And of course, the bridge between him and Donovan McNabb, and again, Terrell had some good points, and Donovan had some good, the, Terrell always has some good points. Right. He's smart. Mm -hmm. And then with the Cowboys, I was close to several of the players on that team, and they said it degenerated all the way down to, he finally accused Tony Romo of, of throwing to his best man in his wedding, Jason Witten, too often at the expense of Terrell Owens. Mm -hmm. And Jason took it so personally that before one practice, Jason challenged Terrell Owens to a fight in front of the whole team right there. Let's settle it right here. And Terrell said, no, I don't want any part of that because Jason's a little bigger than Terrell, but whatever. But that's how furious Jason Witten got at, at just the notion that got out in the media that Tony Roman was favoring him over Terrell Owens at the expense of the football team. So these things just kept happening. And, and after a while, I said, man, Bill Walsh, who I was very close with in San Francisco, he, he kept telling me, we, we've tried everything. We even got a personal psychiatrist, psychiatrist for Terrell because he's been through so, so many family issues as a kid. And, and he's a little paranoid. And we're trying to work him through all this because he doesn't have to be the, he's too good. Bill Walsh should tell me, He's the best on the chalkboard I've ever seen, at the, or if you want to call it to, to update, the whiteboard. Mm -hmm. X's and O's, Terrell knew every position on the offense, and he could explain it to you at the chalkboard. High football IQ. Mm -hmm. And this would just drive Bill Walsh crazy. Bill Walsh was the greatest coach and selector of talent I was ever around. So that if that guy tells me that Terrell Owens has high football IQ, I'm taking it to my bank. Mm -hmm. and, and I've told Terrell this to his face many times, yet you, you couldn't accept it. You couldn't make peace with it and say, I want to be a leader of the football team instead of a divisive force. So we, we come all the way down to, he, now he doesn't want to join your team. He, he could be on a team with Jim Brown and Joe Montana and Shannon Sharp. And Shannon Sharp? Really? And you reject that team? And I heard Steve Young, I think it was on ESPN yesterday, saying, hey, and obviously Steve threw footballs to Terrell in San Francisco, and, and Steve's point was, these greats, the living Hall of Famers, they're not going to, they won't like this. They're going to take it personally that you don't want to join them mm -hmm. in the most hallowed building, I think, in all of sports. Because as much as I respect the baseball or basketball Halls of Fame, this is the one to me. This is the man among men. Yeah. Your brother's in it. And it was, but you were there, and you saw it and experienced and absorbed the, the, the greatness of it. It's a spectacle. You know how it is. And yet Terrell's probably happier today that he rejected it because he can still keep the chip on his shoulder. That's who he wants to be.